The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Elisa Baum, and I'm Percona's Director of Product Marketing. We'll begin in just a moment, but first I'd like to conduct a bit of house cleaning. First, if you could please raise your hand using the hand icon located in the Go to Webinar control panel to let me know if you can hear me. That would be appreciated. So please go ahead and click on that. Great, I see hands, thank you very much. Next, during this webinar, you will be on mute. Should you have any questions during the discussion, please go ahead and enter them in the questions field within the control panel. At the end of this webinar, we'll take as much time as possible to answer questions. Those that aren't addressed will be answered in a follow-up blog post on my Percota's MySQL performance blog. And in addition, I will make sure that everyone has a recording of this webinar within the next 48 hours. So with that said, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, How to Avoid Common but Deadly MySQL Operation Mistakes, prepared by Bricona Principal Instructor Bill Carwin. With that said, I'll turn the floor over to Bill. Bill, go ahead. Thanks, Elisa. Thanks for that introduction. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to be talking today about a, uh, a very fun topic about common but deadly MySQL operations mistakes and how to avoid them. Percona does a lot of services in consulting, support, remote DBA services, and in my department, training. And we see a lot of mistakes that people make. And uh, uh, not casting any stones, we've all been there, but uh, we try to do our best to share information and knowledge about how to avoid them and what the impact of these problems are. So why don't I get right into it. The, one of the problems that I've seen I call mystery configuration. And I'll tell, me, tell you an anecdote about illustrating that. On one of the uh, audits that I helped uh, for a customer in consulting, they had a MySQL server that had restarted, but the, the MySQL daemon didn't start up. They would refuse to start. And after some investigation, we looked in their config file at cmy.cnf. <coughs> we found that the uh, line that described the log file size was commented out. So it looked like this with a, a hash mark in front of it. It was declared to be 128 megabytes, but the file, and the file on disk was matching. But by commenting out that line in the configuration file, MySQL had to resort to the default value of 5 megabytes and uh, on, on earlier versions of MySQL. <clears throat> this didn't match the file size on disk, so MySQLD determined I can't start up with a, a suspect configuration because the log file is important for uh, uh, verifying that we're with the database is intact. So it refused to start. The problem was nobody knew why that line was commented out. It certainly shouldn't have been. And uh, because it could have happened in editing that file some indeterminate amount of time earlier, uh, nobody could recall when that happened, who had done it, or, or why. And it made me think of the classic cartoons in the newspaper uh, with the little kids who always say, I didn't do it, or not me, when there's a uh, mythical ghost called not me who is the one responsible for those tasks. What could have been done to try to uh, alleviate this? Well, what I recommended to them and what I see uh, happen at a lot of mature uh, IT organizations is to actually keep the configuration files under source control. Use your favorite tool like Git or uh, uh, Mercurial or SVN or whatever is the standard within your company. <clears throat> but this can give you some really good information about who changed the file, when did they make that change, and every commit to a source control system comes with some comment so that uh, the, com the uh, committer is encouraged to describe why they did this change. They may even make reference to an issue tracker. If you have an IT issue tracker, they can say this has made a change per issue, one, two, three, four, refer to that one for more discussion and rationale. You can always find out if you have these files under source control with a command like get blame, it will tell you who was the committer for every given line in the file. If they had done this, they would have known exactly when it occurred and who had done it and found out what was uh, the reason for it. Even without that, if they had a policy that 
entries in the config file would come with a comment uh, that is human readable, they could have actually had some attrib attribution to decide who it was, when they did it, and uh, why. When we talk about best practices for using uh, source control within an, a, a deployment environment, the uh, best practice is to actually work on uh, configuration or code or files on a development server. Then when you're uh, satisfied that they're ready for deployment, check them into the source control system. And then the source control system becomes the only source for pushing files to, into production. If, and you can even restrict access to the production server so that the uh, folks who work directly on the code or the configuration files don't have direct access to the production server. Therefore, every push to the production server has to go through this step of being committed into the source control. It uh, discourages people from bypassing that process uh, so that all the, the files are assured to be safe under source control. I often hear pushback on that. We need to be more agile. We can't be going through a process to push things. There's changes we need to make directly on the production server. And I actually find that that becomes less true uh, the larger organization, the more complex operation you're running, it becomes more and more important, not less important, to have uh, this kind of a process to assure that if you have multiple people making changes on the server, make sure that you have it under uh, source control. And I've seen a lot of uh, companies find that they have to go to this uh, uh, model as they get larger and more mature. Another pattern that I've seen is what I called abandoned experiments. For example, you could have a configuration file for MySQL which is too large to be readable. Often people start with a configuration file of one of the uh, uh, samples that are provided with the MySQL product. The largest one that I've seen is just called myinnodbheavy.cnf. It's 479 lines long. It has many uh, settings for uh, configuration and lengthy comments describing how those uh, uh, configuration uh, variables work. But um, it means that if you ever make any changes that are different from the, the uh, boilerplate sample, it becomes hard to track those down. You're trying to hunt for a given line within this almost 500 line long file, you start to wonder uh, which ones you changed. <clears throat> Often people change variables uh, experimentally, and they, they increase values without modifying the, the comments. If you've got 400 lines of comments describing things, how do you find the comment that describes the, uh, the one that you were writing instead of the one that came with the sample file? Changing variables away from their default values, uh, you make the file even longer. And if you make frequent changes, you can uh, also confuse the matter. The pattern that I see often is also is that sites change the uh, configuration values without knowing what they'll do, just to see what will happen. And then afterwards, they leave those experimental changes uh, in their configuration file without returning them back to the default or even the sample value. And you have no record of who made that change what was the reason or whether it made any difference. So the, the uh, uh, sort of the tuning by try everything method. Sometimes if you're changing values away from their default values, you could be uh, masking better values for those variables that are become defaults in future versions of uh, MySQL. For example, you may have uh, a, a small default value for a variable in one version of MySQL. You've tuned it up to uh, um, a moderate high value, but then the better, even better value is the new default in a new version of MySQL. And by having the override in your config file, you obscure your uh, uh, ability to be able to take advantage of that new default. The log file size is one good example where the new default in 5.6 is quite a bit higher than it was previously. And there are quite a few others. <clears throat> so ideally, we could leave the defaults alone. Uh, if the, the defaults are good for uh, typical workloads, 
uh, they're probably good for your workload. And in many cases, this is true. So you can leave the config values at their default unless you have some uh, uh, specific tests that you've done to prove that changing the, those config values have made a difference in your environment. And to me, that means having a uh, uh, environment where we can test that, put that into uh, uh, a reproducible and testable kind of uh, repeatable way of uh, making sure that those variables have something to do with our workload, and then we can finally put them into production. Otherwise, we'll leave them alone. Keep in mind that you don't necessarily need to tune a lot of variables. In fact, in most MySQL installations I've audited, many of the variables don't need to be changed at all from their default levels. A good example is uh, cases when I've been asked, will MySQL run faster if I increase the buffer pool size? And the answer is, well, maybe, but it depends on your traffic and it depends on the size of your database. In an example like this one I show, you may have a buffer pool size of 96 megabytes. And you're wondering if you increase it to 128 megabytes, will it make things run faster? But in fact, your database is still very small and it's only occupying a fraction of that available space. So you could increase it, but it will make no material difference. You want to understand where your bottlenecks are before you change the uh, configuration values. Aimless tuning, that is tuning without a plan to, uh, to uh, guide you. I try to keep in mind uh, advice from carpenters. They say measure twice, cut once. And what they're trying to do is uh, assure themselves that they haven't made a mistake in doing the uh, measurements. And if they cut a board too short, then that wastes that whole board if it, they can't uh, uh, add more length to a board. We can adopt a similar principle in a tuning of a database server. And my habit is to first have a goal, make sure that I have some measurable indicator of performance. For example, if I see a lot of uh, sorting activity uh, uh, resulting from queries, there may be uh, cases where the sorting is using the disk. These are called sort merge passes. That is, if you're sorting a result set, that's too large to fit inside the, uh, the buffer called the sort buffer, it will do the sort in batches. It will sort part of the result, then save that to disk, move on to the next batch, sort that portion, and then merge it with what's on disk. So you could get multiple sort merge passes per query if the sort buffer is too small. So we want to measure how fast the, uh, the number of sort merge passes is rising before we go and, and change that. So we might have a trend line like this. The number of sort merge passes over time rises a little bit irregularly, but pretty steadily and uh, in a fairly steep angle, which indicates we have a fairly high number of sort merge passes per minute. So the rate of increase is what I'm looking at. Then we want to try to research the range of reasonable values. And this requires reading the, the documentation, understanding how it works, perhaps reading blog posts look, or uh, looking at uh, uh, benchmarks that other people have done. Try to fill up your knowledge about that tuning parameter before you go changing it. And then when I want to uh, change it, I'll choose a modest increase. For example, the sort buffer size defaults to 256 kilobytes. So I could raise it to 384 kilobytes as a, a modest change. And then I want to do another test to see if there is any uh, change in the behavior of the performance after making that change. So re-measure. This is where we get the measure twice uh, uh, guideline from the, the carpentry advice. So at the point where I made that change in this graph, we see that the steepness of the curve changed in a visible way. It still didn't go flat. That's OK. Something like sort merge passes uh, we, we don't necessarily need to increase the sort buffer size to the point where uh, it accounts for every single query we ever run. We'd, we would want uh, some amount of use of the disk for uh, the cases where this, the result sets are very large. And increasing the sort buffer to handle the largest query we ever run 
would probably be overkill for all the more modest queries. What I'm looking for here is to flatten out the, the uh, uh, steepness of the curve somewhat. You know, don't make it absolutely flatline, but just reduce the rate of increase. How can we get these graphs? Well, there's a couple of good tools that I can recommend. One is the PT Mext, which is one of the tools in the Percona toolkit. And this is a console mode uh, tool that can monitor uh, counters and other status indicators in MySQL and trend them over time. So it can show you the, the, uh, the deltas between fixed intervals of time. You could tell it, for example, measure the status variables every 10 seconds and then show them to me in a columnar fashion. PT Mext is actually one of my favorite tools in the Percona toolkit. If you want something a little bit more visual, you can use the Percona monitoring plugins. These are uh, templates for cacti or Zabbix that can integrate into your existing uh, monitoring and trending tool and build in some instrumentation for MySQL so you can see these the rates of increases of sort merge passes or many, many other uh, indicators. Both of these tools, the Percona Toolkit and the Percona Monitoring Plugins are free and open source offerings from Percona.com. Be careful about over allocation. I, uh, I stressed that we should increase these variables by a modest amount because you, they're always going to be using resources on the server as we increase them. Some of these uh, buffers in MySQL are allocated once per server. Those are the global ones, like InnoDB buffer pool size, or log buffer size, or query cache size. <clears throat> but some of the variables are allocated per thread, that is, per connection that an application makes to the database server. Be careful about increasing these too much, because if you suddenly had a spike in the number of threads, then you could potentially, uh, although that's kind of in theory, you could potentially have a lot of memory be allocated all of uh, a short time. So you would not want to increase the sort buffer size to a gigabyte or something large like that. You'd want to keep it more modest. I put some asterisks on a few of these on this slide to indicate that not only can they be allocated in the scope that I described, but they can be allocated more than once in that scope. So for example, the join buffer and the temp table size, you could have a complex query that uses more than one join buffer, even in a single thread. Brittle backups. Of course, uh, it, <clears throat> it's obvious that uh, making no backups is also a sin of uh, database operations, but we, I think we can agree that that one is uh, uh, the, the one that we all uh, avoid. But making brittle backups, what does that mean? For example, I had a, a site that uh, had an emergency crash and uh, they needed to restore from backup. That was the easiest way for their, them to recover their database. But unfortunately, when they went to try to retrieve their backup to restore it, they discovered that up to the last six months of those backups that had been created by automated tasks had been being saved on a file system that was 100% full. So it was not able to save the entire uh, content of the backup. And therefore, none of the backups that they thought that they had made over the last six months were actually recoverable. This could be a disaster. If you have a damaged database and no ability to recover it and no ability to get uh, the, the recovery for anything newer than six months ago, this could be the, the uh, uh, problem that causes you to turn off the lights for that business. Many of the businesses today are uh, entirely dependent on the data that they collect and manage. And if they lose that data, then they could be in a very, very uh, bad situation. So it, it behooves you to make sure that a backup and recovery process is one of the things that you absolutely treat as critical for your business. Another uh, story along these lines. One of my customers uh, asked me to review an automation script that he had created to run backups. And it was a shell script. And I reviewed it, and it was, had commands in it to back up the database using Percona Extra Backup, and that was fine. And uh, there was also some other external assets, uh, files and images and things that it uh, provided 
in the same process to, to run the backups at the same time. That was fine. And then at the end, it emailed him to notify him that the backup was successful. And he used a good command line tool to uh, send the email in that manner. But what I advised him was the commands that were being run to perform those backup steps were being run and then there's the success of them was not being checked by the script. Many of the commands will indicate whether they're successful or have failed by their exit status, but his script was not paying attention to that. In this case, if the, it gets to the end of the script and it would email him with the no, notice that it was uh, uh, successful without regard to whether it was actually successful. So we worked with him to uh, advise him on how to interpret the exit status of the various commands and to build that into his logic in his shell script and uh, send a alert in case anything goes wrong instead of just assuming that it, it uh, uh, all succeeded by the time it gets to the bottom of the script. So that was just the process of trying to refine that. But it points out that you need to be active about checking to see uh, if the, the processes were successful. In fact, we can also trust but verify. Even if we the script was uh, indicated success, we want to also confirm that that was successful. And that means doing some test runs or some uh, fire drills to make sure that the backups are restorable. And to do this on a regular basis, it's absolutely critical to make sure that your backups can be relied upon. So it, uh, it should be part of your uh, safety processes to make sure that, of that. The best way to do that is to try it. Restore that backup on a testing or stage server in your environment. If you don't have the ability to have a, a separate machine for this, use a virtual machine, uh, like uh, running under VirtualBox, or you could use a, a cloud machine that you use temporarily for this test, like an Amazon EC2 instance. Or you can also start up a, a secondary instance of MySQL on any machine using a tool like MySQL Sandbox. MySQL Sandbox is a great uh, uh, utility that was developed by the QA manager of MySQL uh, to try to uh, launch uh, user space uh, MySQL instances. You don't even need to be a super user to run these. And you can do them in any directory you want. So it could be handy to uh, start up an instance of MySQL and then shut it down uh, for testing purposes. And likewise, as I mentioned on the previous slide, make sure that any of your automation for backups and restore have proper error detection and error reporting. How can we verify that a backup was successfully restored in these tests? Well, one of the ways is if there's a, a restore command, make sure that it completes and indicates success in its exit status. Things like uh, extra backup with the dash dash copy back uh, option will uh, tell you that. Or you may have to, or if you're restoring a logical dump type file, you may uh, replay that with the MySQL client and then test to see that the, that was successful and completed. Then being active about testing that the database uh, uh, contains the right data once it's restored. Here's a few tips on ways that you could do this in a fairly lightweight manner. One way is to make sure that all the databases and tables and indexes are identical to what you expect. For example, you could have saved a copy of just this, the uh, schema definition, no data, but just the DDL from your production server when you created the backup. And you could save that in a file called baseline.sql, for example. And then after you do this test restore, you could dump out the DDL from that uh, instance and diff that against your baseline. If there's any differences, it means that you're missing some tables or indexes or other objects. So make sure that you uh, uh, have that baseline that indicates what it should look like and then you can test it against that. You could also run a few uh, SQL queries against the restored uh, instance as a smoke test. You probably just need a few, maybe half a dozen queries if you choose them to be representative of queries that are run from your application. Likewise, you could replay a sample of binary logs. Any of the, the binary logs that uh, occurred immediately after the, the backup that you made 
uh, the original backup, then when you restore it, you could replay that sample of binary logs. You probably only need a few minutes worth of binary logs to uh, achieve uh, this. But the idea is that you would replay those against the, the uh, test restored version. And if they run with no errors, for example, they find the tables that they're looking for, all the SQL works, and it results in uh, uh, successful statements, it means at least that you have the right tables and, and some data. This doesn't verify the content of the data, but just the fact that the queries can run against this instance. And finally, check some table is a statement that many people overlook. It's part of MySQL by default, and it will read the entire table and report to you uh, a checksum value that's generated from the entire content of the table. This, uh, in theory, you could compare this against the checksums that were generated at the time you backed up, but you may not have those available. At the very least, a checksum table will tell you if it could read those tables and uh, uh, avoid any uh, physical corruption. This could be a risk of, uh, of a physical backup that part of it gets physically corrupted in the process of being saved and then restored. And checksum table will, by nature, visit every page in the database so that at least you can be assured that the MySQL instance can read them. <clears throat> it's also worthwhile testing the restore process just to get practice in your recovery process. You don't want to get into a situation where you have an emergency and need to restore a database and uh, then wonder, what are the steps that we need to do to do the recovery? Where are the files? Uh, who has access to do this? That can uh, lead you to have additional minutes of downtime when you're trying to do the recovery, and that's the last thing we want to do during uh, the, the times that we would need to recover. The, you could also helps you to encourage you to have automation scripts for the disaster recovery. If you need to have this testing process for uh, uh, making sure that the recovery is valid, then it would be useful for you to develop scripts to help you make that as quick and, and painless as possible. And that will help you during an emergency too, to make sure that you have scripts that work, that are well tested and regularly tested, and that everybody knows how to invoke them. And finally, the uh, other benefit of testing is that you'll have a feel, because you do it frequently, of how much time it takes to recover, of, uh, and testing that against a recent version of your database. Databases always grow, so if you had last tested a restore maybe 12 months ago, then you would know how long it took you then, but you don't know how long it takes you with the current database. And if you do this testing frequently, you'll have more of a uh, familiarity with that, which can be very useful during an emergency situation when somebody is uh, standing behind you and saying, how long until we're back up? And you can now give them a very precise answer. So I'd like to encourage everybody to have a change of their mindset. Don't think of backups as a backup strategy. A backup that can't be restored isn't much use at all. So let's think of this more as a restore strategy. Make sure that the, uh, the backup is just the means to the end, and the, the real goal is to be able to restore this. Make sure that you have that part of your process. <coughs> Drift happens. What do I mean by this? Well, I could mean this, which would be awesome. And uh, that's something that we can all enjoy. But that's actually not what I mean by this drift. In this case, I mean replication drift happens. That is, uh, many of us run replication environments where we have a slave that's supposed to be a true replica of the master. But it may not be a true replica of the master. There's various ways that we can get into trouble there non-deterministic queries that do something different on the slave than they did on the master can lead to data discrepancies on the slave that we don't uh, know about immediately. Or somebody may have uh, accidentally or uh, mischievously changed data directly on the slave. So you, you have updates that are occurring on the slave that never happened on the master because somebody was connecting directly to it. And the other risk is that data discrepancies tend to compound. That is, if you change a little bit of data, but then subsequent updates that run on the slave, even through uh, normal replication channels, use the, those wrong data values.
values and then use those to update other data values, you can get changes that tend to um, snowball in nature. And you'll never know about it because MySQL doesn't actually have any built-in means of checking to make sure that the slave is a uh, faithful replica of the master. Of course, the impact of, of having this happen, if you ever send a query to a replication slave and it has wrong data, then you're going to get the wrong query results. And that will lead you to have uh, improper behavior in your application or bad reports uh, and many other effects. It sort of goes without saying. Also, many people use a replication slave as the source for their backups to try to minimize the amount of load that's on their production master. This is okay to do as long as the slave has a uh, accurate uh, replica of the master. If it, the slave is wrong, then the backup is kind of useless because you wouldn't be able to use it to restore and get back to the correct data state. And finally, if the slave has wrong data, it would not be suitable to use as a failover server. That is, if the master ever needs to go offline, you'd like to have the ability to switch your application traffic to use the slave, and the slave would become the new master. But it, you, that also relies on the fact that the slave has a perfect replica of the master. So some of the solutions to prevent data drift. Uh, one way to mitigate this is to make sure that users can only read, they cannot write changes on the, on the slave. So on um, every instance except for your primary master, I, I would recommend setting the read-only uh, option. The uh, root user and any user that was super privileged can ignore this. They can still make changes. So this would be a good reason to not allow uh, applications to use the root user and be very uh, conservative about who in your environment has access to that root user or any other MySQL user with the super privilege. And another way to reduce the risk of non-deterministic queries is to use row-based replication. I'm surprised that how few sites use row-based replication, but uh, this is actually a very good way of making sure that you don't have uh, uh, statements that do an update that use random numbers or uh, UUIDs or sysdate or other types of queries that uh, risk doing something different on the, on the slave than on the master. So be aware of the bin log format is a good way of doing that and try to use that where possible. Detecting data drift can be done with another Percona Toolkit tool, PT Table Checksum. Many of you are using this, many of you are not. Uh, and this can be a very good way to test uh, integrity of a slave. You would run this on the master and it would calculate checksums over chunks of rows in every table by default. And then those same calculations would flow through this, the same replication uh, uh, mechanism, calculate the same uh, uh, checksums against this, ostensibly the same chunks of rows on the slave. But if there are any rows missing or have wrong data, the checksum would be different. And any chunk for which the checksum is different represents a data discrepancy. Hopefully, that's a very small uh, uh, part of your database. On one occasion, I helped a customer who had a database of about 250 gigabytes, and they had never run a checksum, or hadn't in a very, very long time, and we finally got uh, permission to run this, and we did so at an off-peak hour, and found that 30% of this, the data on the slave was wrong, which was kind of made the slave pretty useless in, in that time, we, and we had to correct that. After that, I uh, instituted a cron job to help them run the PT table checksum on a regular basis. We did this weekly. Uh, in that environment, it was a good time to do it on Saturday night. That was the time of their least load. And for their 250 gig database, it took about four to five hours to run a full checksum of the, of the whole database. And that was something that they could do. Running that checksum doesn't interrupt traffic. It can still run concurrently. It just added a little bit of extra load to the servers. <clears throat> Once we did that, uh, we were able to examine the results uh, as soon as possible after the checksum finished. You could even build that into an alerting tool so that it would check automatically to see if any of the chunks report any discrepancies. In fact, 
Percona monitoring plugins will work with Nagios as a, a, a very popular alerting tool, and it will find if any of those chunks are reported as different and let you know about them immediately. What do you do about that once you find some discrepancies? Well, there's another Percona Toolkit tool. It's, it's great how there's a Percona Toolkit tool for just about every problem that you can come up with. PT Table Sync helps you. It will examine the, the same set of checksum results that the, the PT Table checksum generated and uh, try to correct data by finding the minimal amount of changes it needs to do to reinsert data on the master. This will be a no-op on the master. It'll just read the current values on the master and reinsert them. So it essentially makes no change. But the fact that it has done this gets propagated through the replication log and performs the same operation on the slaves, which will replace wrong data or add missing data on the slaves so that it gets back into sync. Once I helped the customer institute a regular checksum, we were able to uh, uh, run the PT table sync on a regular basis and correct it. And only once every few months were there small discrepancies. Maybe every three months we'd see it, just a handful of rows were wrong. Index hoarding is the next pattern. And this is the picture I found to illustrate this. It looks like everybody, every column, every index, every scrap of data has a, a uh, index for it. Indexes can uh, overpopulate. You can have too many indexes. And the, the cost of this is that it consumes some space on disk. In this uh, example, I've done a show table status, and I show that there is uh, uh, data length, which is the data rows for a table, and then there's index length, which is the, the number of bytes occupied by secondary indexes. And that's just to demonstrate that there is some storage space being used by indexes at all times. Indexes also occupy part of your buffer pool. Both data pages and index pages can occupy the buffer pool. Actually, in the case of buffer pool, they call the data pages index pages as well, because everything's an index in InnoDB. But in this case, we see that there's a, a title table, and it has some pages associated with its primary, its clustered index, and then there's a couple of other indexes which also occupy space. So the more indexes you have, the more chance you have for consuming more of your buffer pool. And it makes life uh, more uh, uh, hard for the query optimizer. Anytime the, you run a query, it has to examine what possible indexes could pertain to optimizing the query and then assess the, the uh, uh, cost and benefit to using that index and finally decide on which one to use. This happens on every query. So if you have 16 indexes on your table, then it could add a lot more work for the query optimizer. And if you have fewer indexes, it would be less work and hopefully the overhead of running queries would be less. You can have duplicate indexes. Duplicates uh, come in different forms. You could either have indexes on the exact same columns, or you could have indexes on the left prefix of columns. Here's an example where I have a table with x and y, an index on column x, and then I add another index with a two-column index for x and y, which makes the first one superfluous. Any query that would uh, benefit from the first index would also benefit from the second in the same way. Every time I've done an audit for a database, it's turned out that to have at least a few of these types of uh, overlapping or duplicate indexes. And the worst case that I found was auditing a database two terabytes in size, and I found 400 gigabytes of duplicate indexes, so about 20% of the total size. We were able to uh, uh, advise them to shrink their database by 20% and at the same time make the optimizer's job easier by uh, reducing the number of superfluous indexes. MySQL 5.6 uh, has some new uh, features to try to give you some notice. And as a warning, if you attempt to create an index which is a, uh, a full overlap, it only catches the cases where you have the exact same number of columns and the exact same columns as, uh, as another existing index so far. And it generates a note warning. MySQL 5.7 is coming in the near future, and they're uh, increasing the strictness of that. Instead of a note, it's actually a true warning, and that warning becomes an error in strict mode. So if you try to create a, a full duplicate index, 
then it will actually cause the creation of the index to fail. In the meantime, you can use a Procurement Toolkit tool, PT Duplicate Checker, to report uh, indexes. It will tell you exactly which columns and advise you to drop that uh, duplicate index. You may even have unused indexes that consume disk space and uh, although if they're unused they won't occupy the buffer pool, they still make the query optimizer's job more work. There's a few solutions for spotting these. One is at Percona Toolkit, PT index usage. If you uh, collect a, a log of queries that are run by your application, feed that into PT index usage, it will analyze every one of them and find which indexes are used by the queries and any indexes you have that are not referenced by any query, it will report to you that those are unused. But that's uh, a little bit uh, troublesome because it's only as good as the completeness of your query log. If you uh, have other queries that weren't included in that log, then you'll get an incomplete view of that. So there are a couple of other solutions. One is performance schema in uh, modern versions of MySQL. It collects these statistics of index uh, usage, essentially the number of times we loaded an index off of disk, and that indicates that we used it. So there's no need to feed it a log, but keeping those statistics costs some overhead, and that's been an ongoing uh, struggle with the performance schema is the overhead associated with it. Percona Server has a slightly different feature, which is a little bit more specific to collecting these statistics. It shows up as an information schema table and you can uh, get a very uh, similar type of report to find out which indexes are utilized versus all the, the full list of indexes in your server. The nice thing about this feature is that the overhead is almost not measurable, it's so low. So you can enable this and give it, keep it running 24 by 7. I also advise for indexes to repeat the process of checking for duplicates and checking for unused indexes because that they can change over time. Somebody could uh, make a, a schema migration and add new indexes, which are duplicates of existing indexes. And you can also uh, uh, have unused indexes uh, uh, happen because somebody added an index which is uh, more appropriate to the queries that you have, and therefore indexes that used to be used are no longer used. You could have changes to application code that run queries in a different way that will utilize indexes differently or you could have changes to the types of queries that are run by your users as they use your application. And therefore, if a, a query exists in your, in your code but it's not run anymore, maybe you don't need the index for it. And finally, changes to data. You could have uh, indexes be chosen differently as the data uh, grows or shrinks or changes uh, distribution of values. So repeating this process and keeping it, monitoring it is a worthwhile thing to do. Maybe monthly would be a good idea to try to do a, a reassessment. No capacity monitoring. What happened here? The traffic was much too high for the amount of uh, capacity in the intersection of this road. The different ways we can measure capacity, but I'm going to focus on disk bound because that's the uh, most common uh, source of downtime. Surprisingly, actually uh, having your disk fill up is the, the greatest single cause of downtime for a MySQL instance. Disks are cheap. Why don't we uh, just have space that's, uh, that's well in excess of our needs? Well, it turns out that data keeps on growing. Logs keep on growing, and that can cause uh, problems. My technique for trying to assess the, the capacity planning is first to measure our capacity uh, the maximum that we could have. For disk size, it's easy. You just use DF to tell you how big your data volume is. For the uh, runtime capacity, or how much traffic they can handle, you'd need to use benchmarking tools to try to figure out what the, the uh, maximum amount of traffic you could throw at it. A good tool for this is Sysbench. It's an open source tool. Percona contributes to it regularly. And you can use this to benchmark uh, with or without involvement of MySQL. There's different tests that the tool can run. And then once you have an idea about what your capacity is, then regularly measure your usage relative to that capacity. DF can tell you how much space you're using on the disk as well as how big it is. 
a common tool that's often present on many Linux systems is IOSTAT that can help you to do ad hoc monitoring, find out how many IOPS you're currently uh, demanding from the disk. Uh, it'll tell you about queuing if you have uh, more requests than can be handled by that disk. There's also uh, ways that you can use Percona monitoring plugins to monitor for the usage of the, the disks and to alert you if you have uh, of your overtaxing either the space or the traffic. Regularly testing disk health is another way to avoid downtime. Uh, different tools for uh, testing and uh, assessing the health of disks. This is important to do because disks do fail over time and uh, it can either result in downtime or at least degraded activity. If you have a RAID system where one of the drives goes out you may have a, a lower performance even though you can still use it for uh, some period of time. This also happens on storage area networks. <clears throat> Service interruptions. Anytime you have the a requirement to take your database offline, it's a service interruption. And some of the typical ways that this happens is if you need to run a long-running alter table to try to change the schema for a, uh, a given table, or if you need to shut off MySQL daemon in order to upgrade it to a new version, or if you have a failover architecture, but it just takes too long for the, the failover to happen. And here's some ways we can mitigate that. MySQL 5.5 and 5.6 have new features to uh, make some of these alter table operations faster. For example, 5.5 has fast index creation and even faster drop index so that it's less painful to um, uh, be adding indexes. 5.6 advanced the, the game a great deal. They have a whole bunch of new cases where InnoDB can do online DDL, that is uh, alter table with minimal amount of interruption. It depends on which type of operation you're doing with this alter table, but uh, uh, you can read the documentation to see which operations can be done with what level of uh, uh, shared access. Those can either um, uh, do no locking on the table at all, or they can do shared locking so people can still read but not write, or it'll, or some operations still required you to do uh, full locking as per the old way. PT Online Schema Change is another Percona Toolkit tool that will help you in, in those other cases where the, the uh, online DDL doesn't work. For example, adding a primary key uh, or adding a, a whole new column to a table can uh, uh, be interruptive even with online DDL, but PT Online Schema Change can help in those cases. We've talked about that on webinars and presentations in the past many times, and many of our customers have adopted this and found that it's a great lifesaver for avoiding uh, downtime. For upgrades, we have no ability to uh, do online DDL because an upgrade really requires you to shut down the MySQL daemon. And a good way of doing this is to have a, uh, a pair of servers so that you can swap back and forth. Uh, it, it's very easy to configure two MySQL instances to be slaves of one another. We call this a master-master uh, relationship. And so one of them can be taken offline while the other is handling the application traffic. And then you can swap their roles, make the, the uh, second master be the one that applications are talking to while you take the first one offline. And because MySQL replication is asynchronous, each one of them keeps track of where it left off on subscribing to the other's changes and catches up once it comes back up. For failover, what we really like is to have instantaneous access to all the same data and not have to worry about uh, the time it takes to uh, bring up a new instance. Percona Extra DB Cluster is emerging as the best uh, solution for this, where you have the ability to create a, a whole cluster of nodes all of which can be the master at any time. And they are sharing the changes in, a, in synchronous replication so that they all have the complete set of data at all time. Percona has been uh, deploying this at customer sites for um, over well over a year now, and this is proving to be uh, a, a go-to solution for many workloads. Like any uh, clustering technology, it's not the it's not going to work for every single case, but it is proving to be very useful in a wide variety of cases. <clears throat>
Well, we could go on all day, and uh, there's uh, quite a few other cases of uh, uh, deadly sins that we could talk about with operations, but we'll probably do another presentation along the same lines with uh, new topics in the future. Or you can go to the Percona Live MySQL Conference and Expo, and there will be many sessions and tutorials from experts that will be talking about uh, these types of issues as well as uh, cutting edge solutions and technologies that can uh, bring new solutions to uh, solve them. If you want to make sure you get the best rate, you can use the early bird rate that is going to be ending February 5th. And as a special discount for listening to this webinar, please use the code WebinarSC and give an additional 10% off. So thanks very much for listening, and I'd be glad to take any questions to fill out the time that we have. Okay, Bill, thank you so much. That was very, very informative. Uh, we do have questions, and people, please go ahead and enter any additional questions that you have in the GoToWebinar control panel. And I just want to remind people that I will be sending a link to both the recording of this presentation and the slides so that you can look at it again and also um, share it with your peers. So with that said, I am going to go ahead and read the questions. You ready, Bill? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, great. Let's see here. What if I use rsync to sync the MySQL dir directory to another server as a backup? And this was referencing when you were talking about backup strategy or restore strategy. Right. Um, some people do try to use rsync uh, for, uh, as a backup method. The problem with using rsync is that um, it will copy the, uh, the data files, but if you're sim simultaneously making changes to those data files, and the changes are going on uh, during the, the uh, uh, number of seconds that you, you were doing the rsync, you could get parts of the data files copied over to the new server in some random order. That is, uh, the changes are happening in different places within the physical file, but the rsync is maybe reading through it sequentially. So it may miss uh, uh, blocks of the file that are changing more recently than the point at which rsync passes by that earlier point. The, the impact is that you end up getting essentially a uh, corrupted file on the other side once you have the, the uh, uh, copy finish on the other server. A better solution for this is to use Percona Extra Backup. Percona Extra Backup will retain the, the uh, state of data in an intact fashion as of the time that it finishes that copy. And Percona Extra Backup can do something similar to what rsync does, which is to stream that data over a network to another server. So I'd, I would advise you to look into Percona Extra Backup. It's another free open source tool that we offer. And it will do physical backups as fast as rsync or near about and with preserving the uh, data integrity. So it's much better than using that. OK. Thanks for that question. Thank you for answering it. The next question is, is mixed bin log format useful as well as row? Mixed bin log format is basically it's statement-based bin log format by default. But if the MySQL ever detects that there's a, um, a query that it can tell is non-deterministic, it will switch to row-based automatically just for that one statement. Of course, this is only as good as its ability to detect non-deterministic queries. Uh, so if there's any um, missing cases in that uh, algorithm, then it could inadvisably use a uh, statement-based format for the individual statements. I would go with row-based format uh, as, as a default. The only other uh, caveat to using row-based is that if you had a, an update that affected a million rows, for example, it would have to add a lot of data to the, your binary log, and that can cause binary logs to grow uh, very quickly. So in those cases, it may be more advisable to use statement-based uh, or mixed, uh, mixed mode. But I, I would think that row-based is a preferable mode. OK. The next question is, um, to verify or restore, can the check table extended command be used? This supposedly makes sure the table is consistent. I was wondering if this is still useful in uh, to verify or restore in the latest versions of MySQL. That's a good question. I have not investigated that particular aspect of the check table uh, or checksum table. Uh, 
um, what I'll offer to do is uh, to address that in a follow-up blog post, and I'll try to make some comments about that. Okay. Uh, next question so I will, is... I will follow, I'll follow up on that. Perfect. Yeah. For Kona MySQL version 5.1, will this version be compatible with the PTMEXT tool? Yes, I've used PTMEXT quite a lot with uh, uh, MySQL 5.1 and it w works just fine. Uh, there could be some of the status variables that are new in newer versions, and so those simply wouldn't be present in, in the uh, uh, older version of MySQL, but that shouldn't upset anything. So uh, yeah, people have been using PTMEXT with Percona, 5 or Percona Server or MySQL 5.1 quite a lot. Okay, the next question was when you were talking about indexing. And it is, um, does Query Optimize really help, or Query Optimizer rather, um, and for large databases like 100 gigabytes plus, how will it be affected? <clears throat> the Query Optimizer runs for every query. And it will do its best idea to, to figure out the, the order of tables to access and which indexes in each of those tables to use. If you had a very large table with 100 gigabytes, it would still uh, decide to use indexes where appropriate, but uh, at that size of table, you may find that um, even an index doesn't help you speed it up to the level that you want. Other solutions could uh, include uh, partitioning, so that you would actually be accessing a, a table which is physically only a fraction of the size of your whole 100, meg 100 gigabyte table, and then within that partition, uh, again, it would be accessing rows using a, an index. So the combination of partitioning and indexing can be very effective. I'll try to find a, uh, a good presentation that demonstrates this, and I'll include that in the uh, blog post that we use to follow up. Okay, next question. Is there a list of measurable indicators of performance somewhere? That's a tough one. <clears throat> the um, uh, Many of the measures of performance we get sort of implicitly by monitoring uh, variables in the show global status command. The, the rate at which uh, certain things are changing, for example, how many times are we creating temporary tables on disk per, per uh, minute, or uh, how many times are we doing sorting per minute, how many uh, uh, times are we doing I.O. to the InnoDB table spaces. It, it can be very tricky to find out where your bottleneck is. So there's, as, and in a way, the answer is yes, there's a, a, a list, but it's almost too much information rather than uh, something that's a nice guideline. And your job is to figure out which one of those is your bottleneck. Uh, many times you have to put the information together from various sources. For example, not only MySQL status variables, but also measure uh, performance from system tools like IOSTAT and VMSTAT and kind of correlate the information. There's a, a good tool in the Percona Toolkit called, um, uh, I'm blanking on the tool name right now, um, uh, the uh, uh, tools in the Percona Toolkit can collect all that information from various uh, sources, both MySQL and system related tools at the same moment, so it's easier to put them all together and, and uh, correlate them. And that can say, okay, when I have uh, excessive disk queuing, as reported by IOSTAT, what's happening in MySQL at the same moment. And there you can put together kind of a story as to uh, what the uh, correlation is and try to pinpoint what the, the root cause is. So it's kind of an art. You have to be able to read many different uh, sources of information and find the patterns. That's about as good of an uh, answer I can give you at this time. Somebody said it was PT stock. Is that what you're talking about? Mm. Exactly. Thank you. I just the, the word exited my brain. Cool. Thank you, audience. All right. The next question is, um, how does most of this apply to Amazon's RDS? Not having root, direct root access seems like a problem. Yeah, exactly. Amazon RDS is a, a attractive as a ready-made appliance for MySQL in the cloud but it comes with some limitations. Many of the tuning parameters you can't access or you can only access through a graphical interface. You can't SSH in there, so many of the tools that we would like to run, uh, like IOSTAT, we can't run. We are only able to get the metrics that they expose through their RDS control panel. In some ways, what my conclusion about RDS has been is that 
this is maybe a controversial statement, but as soon as you get to the point where you're concerned about performance, you've already outgrown Amazon RDS. And the and, and you need to move to a different platform like EC2 or your own hosted uh, servers. And the reason I say that is that there's enough limitations in tuning Amazon RDS that you uh, uh, we may not be able to achieve optimal performance. The primary value of RDS is convenience. Okay, well we are at the top of the hour and there are several more questions, Bill. So. What Bill will do is create a follow-up blog post on Percona's MySQL performance blog and answer your questions. And also you'll be able to contact him um, if you have additional questions. And I believe you have your contact information in the presentation. Is that right, Bill? I'll make sure that there is, yes. Okay, great. Well, everybody, thank you so very much for your time today. And we are looking forward to seeing you in a future webinar. And Bill, thank you again for a great presentation. Thanks for putting it together.